If you have your uh, Bibles, take them and turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Uh, Luke chapter 6, where we'll pick up at verse uh, 17, continuing our series, preaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter through this third gospel. If you are using the church Bibles, this is found on page 862. Luke chapter 6, where we'll read from verse 17 through verse 23. And he, that is Jesus, came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, "'Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Well, Jesus has just selected the twelve to be His apostles, twelve men handpicked by Jesus to be His authorized representatives, sent by Jesus to proclaim the good news that He Himself has been proclaiming, that the kingdom of heaven was now at hand with His arrival. Twelve men handpicked by Jesus to go out and tell their hearers that every longing of their heart was found fulfilled in Jesus, that He was the one in whom their security and joy and peace could be found, to go out and invite their hearers to come in, to repent of their sins, to lay hold of Christ by faith, and freely receive and enjoy the manifold blessings that come only from His hands. It was a definitive moment. As Luke has brought us through these scenes unfolding for us, wonder upon wonder of this new world that Jesus is establishing, but now telling us that this good news is one that is not to be contained to the few that lay within the hearing of Jesus, but that this was good news that was to be proclaimed far and wide in the whole world to be invited to come in and enjoy these manifold blessings. That picking of the twelve, as we saw last week, standing as something of a conclusion to those previous series of scenes, as Jesus, as we, Luke has brought us from Jesus preaching in Nazareth all the way through these scenes to that proclamation of this gospel far and wide. And now the scene changes. As Jesus comes down from this mountain where He has been praying all night in, the, in, in preparation for choosing the twelve, Jesus comes down to stand on this level place, as Luke calls it. The scene changes. Up until now, Luke has been rotating the diamond. He's been showing us the very various facets of the gospel that we might see it as rich and full as it is. But now Luke brings us in to hear Jesus as he comes to address this crowd of disciples who have begun to follow him. And as he begins to essentially describe for them, describe for us how all of this comes to bear on our lives here and now. Now, we haven't heard much about these disciples up until now. They've been hovering in the background. We've known of the sick coming to Jesus. We've known of the crowds that have flocked to come and hear His preaching and receive His healing. But now, we're told that within this crowd, there are a group of people who are to be distinguished by their dedication to Jesus. Whenever we read the Gospels, we have to keep four groups of people in mind. There are those that are termed the multitude. That's the, that's the broadest term. 
It includes believers, but it also includes skeptics and opponents. It includes really all of those who have come out to Jesus to hear what He is saying and to watch what He is doing, but, but with no particular comment on how they are responding to Him. Within that multitude, there are these disciples, a, a crowd within a crowd, a crowd of, uh, the, whose size will rise and fall, but, but who are all united by the fact that they have made some sort of commitment to Jesus. They have heard enough of what Jesus is saying. They've seen enough of what He is doing that they want to hear more and see more. Uh, even, even more than that, they've, they've heard enough of what he is saying, that they have come to, to believe that Jesus is the one who is fulfilling messianic prophecy, and, and they have come even with a, at least a tacit belief that, that he is the Messiah long expected and anticipated. Of course, within this group of disciples, there are the twelve who we saw chosen last week, those chosen by Jesus to have this unique ministry along Side him, these twelve chosen, you remember Mark's phrase, to be with Jesus, to be his particular command, uh, companions, his, his closest friends. And then within the twelve, there are the three, uh, James and John and Peter, who are selected for special moments, like to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And of course, amongst the three, there is the one, John the disciple whom Jesus loved. We've always got to keep these groups of people in mind. They, they're always in the scene somewhere or other, and they're playing a particular function at particular times. And, and it's here that, that Luke brings us in to see Jesus addressing that, that second group, that within the multitude that were all around Jesus, there is this group of disciples, and it's them that Jesus is turning to address here this group of people who have heard the gospel that has been preached, who have seen the miracles that have been performed, and on the basis of that have made some kind of commitment to Jesus, a commitment to follow Him, a commitment to learn from Him, a commitment to serve Him. And at this point in His ministry, Jesus has something particular that He wants to teach that particular group of people. And, and what is it? He wants to teach them that the life of a disciple is not a life of glory, but a life of poverty and hunger and weeping and rejection. It's not exactly the sales pitch for the kingdom of God that we might come up with. A few weeks ago at Easter, perhaps you heard about this, there was a, there was a well-known church that resolved that on Easter Sunday they weren't going to mention the atonement, and they weren't going to use the word sacrifice or the blood of Jesus. Their statement said, for us, the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. This means reaching people far from God, so we're not going to use the words Calvary, resurrection, or the phrase, the blood of Jesus. We won't use language that will immediately make someone feel like an outsider. Now, if we're charitable, which is probably how we should always default, uh, it's understandable. We love Jesus. We love the church. We want other people to love Him and the church also. So, we don't want to create barriers to people coming to Christ. We want to see people hear the free offer of the gospel and put their faith in Christ. But as good as that desire is, it's important that those who would come to Christ and put their faith in Him know exactly who Christ is and what the atonement consists of. In order to become a disciple of Jesus, you have to understand just how bad the gospel says your sin is. You have to understand that it is only by the blood of Jesus that your sins can be forgiven because your sins are so bad that it required nothing less than the blood of Jesus to be spilled for your sins to be washed away. And of course, it's only by seeing how bad we are that we can see truly how good and glorious the love of God for us in Jesus Christ is. And so, as much as we want to in 
invite people in and not create unnecessary barriers for people, it is also important that we not water down the gospel beyond what Scripture does. But it's also important, as Jesus does here, that we make clear to anyone and everyone who would come to Jesus and put their faith in Him that, that they understand that there's a cost that comes with being Jesus' disciple. It's important that anyone who would lay hold of Christ realize that the life of a disciple is not a life of, of ease and plenty, but that it is sometimes, often, perhaps always, as Jesus seems to indicate here, a life that will come with particular sorrows that, that come to us because we are disciples of Christ. Look at, look at the setting here. Before we hear what Jesus says in this sermon, Luke establishes the scene. Jesus has come down from this hill, this, this mountain where He's been praying, and He comes down onto this plain. So, this sermon is going to have similarities with the Sermon on the Mount, but it's a different sermon. It's a sermon on this, on this level place. And as Jesus comes down, this crowd of disciples, this crowd, this multitude that have been following, we're all, are all gathered here. So, we, we understand that Jesus has separated Himself from them for the night, and He's labored all night in prayer before He has chosen the twelve. And now He comes down, and the crowd is there, the multitude is there, the swell of people is there before Him. And some, as Luke says, some have come to hear more of what he is preaching. This is compelling and captivating what he is saying about the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament expectation in his arrival, and they want to hear more from him. Others have, have come because they're diseased, and they, and they want him to heal them. They know that he has healed others, and he wants them to do for them what he has done for others. And amongst them, Luke says, there is this group that is distinguished as disciples, those who have, who have made this commitment to, to Jesus. And, and what's the temptation for those disciples? It's a temptation to fall into a theology of glory. Or, or to use a more temp, technical term, there's a temptation for these disciples to, to fall into what we call an over-realized eschatology. What we have seen and heard from Jesus, all the way from that sermon in chapter 4, where He preached from Isaiah 61 in the synagogue in Nazareth and proclaimed that it was fulfilled now in the hearing of that congregation, that, that the year of the Lord's favor was proclaimed, that all of the, the blessings promised and anticipated in the kingdom of God were, were now there because Jesus was there. And all the way through the succeeding scenes where we've seen diseases healed and devils rebuked and sins forgiven, all of it has been, you understand, eschatological. That is to say that all of it is intimately bound up with the establishment of the last days, with the establishment of the last epoch of history. Right? Do, do you understand this? We have to understand that, that everything in history had been leading up to the arrival of Jesus Christ. From the, from the creation, from the Garden of Eden, all the way through, everything has been pointing to and, and leading to the arrival of Jesus Christ, the great Messianic King, in whom and through whom sins would be forgiven, evil defeated, and the people of God finally and fully saved. It's what everything in the Old Testament is about this progressive revelation that, that is this ever-hastening, ever-more-loud drumbeat, drumming on, pressing on as the story progresses, and, and we go on and on, and we hear more of this King, and we long for Him, and we anticipate Him, and all of it issues out in this crescendo when Jesus actually arrives on the scene. That's what Jesus is saying to that congregation in Nazareth when He says, the year of the Lord's favor is here. He says, everything, everything you have read, everything you have studied, everything that you have known about salvation, all the way back to Genesis 3.15, where a Redeemer was promised, all of it is fulfilled now because, Jesus says, because I am I'm here. That's what Jesus has been preaching. That's what Jesus has been 
doing, demonstrating the veracity of his claims. And all of it is, has been a demonstration of what the writer to the Hebrews would say right at the beginning of his book. What is it that he, he says? He says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Right? What's he talking about? He's talking about that prophetic expectation of full salvation. And then he says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You hear what, what the writer's saying? With the arrival of Jesus, there is a definitive change. Long ago, it was anticipated and prefigured by the prophets, but now now it is fulfilled because the Son is here. Think about what, what Peter says in 1 Peter 1.10. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ and them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. You, you hear what he's saying? He's saying in the Old Testament, they, they wrestled with these things. Here was the Spirit of God inspiring these prophets as they wrote these things, and they wrestled with them, and, and they tried to figure out, what does this mean? What does it mean when it talks about this, 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 this Christ, and what does it mean when it talks about His suffering and His glories? But then Peter says it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. He's saying there's been a definitive change. That, that era, that, that period of, of longing and wrestling and intrigue and gazing into these things and wondering has passed because they've all been fulfilled now in the gospel, Peter says, that has been proclaimed to you through the ministry of the twelve apostles and their heirs, the, the gospel that has gone far and wide as the glories of Christ have been preached. These last days have come, he is saying, because, because Jesus has come. It's the very thing that Peter said in Acts 2 when he stood in Jerusalem and he proclaimed to them that Joel's prophecy had now been fulfilled because Jesus was there. All of this is, as we say, eschatological. It all has to do with the end of the ages, with the pinnacle of history, with the final arrival of that day that has lain pregnant in expectation ever since the fall, that, that longing for this Redeemer King who would come and free the people of God from their sins and release them from the weight of evil and bring them into the nearer presence of God. With the coming of Christ, you understand everything has changed. The prophecies have been fulfilled, and the glories of the kingdom of heaven have been revealed and established even. But the enigma of these last days is that it has come, but not like it will come. What Jesus has been preaching really, truly is ours now, but not like it will be. One man put it like this. He says, we live in a theological tension. By faith in Christ, all of these spiritual blessings are ours already. But the full enjoyment of these blessings is not yet ours. If we don't understand this mindset, he says, the theological tension we live in will become a theological disaster we will inevitably misread Scripture, and if we misread Scripture, we will lead misled lives. Jesus doesn't want His followers, especially His disciples, those who have made this commitment to Him to, to come and follow Him and learn from Him. He doesn't want them to misunderstand what He is saying and so then lead misled lives. He wants them to understand this theological tension that all of these blessings are already theirs, but all of these blessings are also not yet 
theirs, at least not yet as they one day will be. Jesus wants to make clear that the fullness of the blessings He brings will not all be enjoyed and experienced at His first coming. Now, it's an enigma. On the one hand, all of these blessings really are ours, and we are able to enjoy them. That, you remember last week, we began with the glories of the opening chapters of Ephesians. If I was to be told I could only preach one book for the rest of my life, I'd pick Ephesians. It's, it's glorious, and those first opening chapters are absolutely mind-blowing and, and heart-soaring. But you remember the, the picture I used, maybe, uh, maybe it was a mistimed illustration, but it works for my millennialness. It's that idea of that scene from Jurassic Park of, of Paul reaching down into the Jeep and, 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 and leading our heads so that we behold the magnificence of the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. And why does he do that? Because he wants it to bear on our lives. Right? Paul is, in, in Ephesians 1 and 2, he's turning our heads so that we see the the, the wonder, the, the overwhelming, breathtaking wonder of all that is yours now in Jesus Christ, now that you have been reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. And Paul's purpose is experiential. He wants the enjoyment of those heavenly realities to bear on our earthly lives. Right? I won't preach Ephesians, but, but if we just follow a little further, you remember the that interpretive key to the book of Ephesians, that all of the verbs in the first half of the book of Ephesians are in the indicative mood. They're all telling you something that God has done for you. And then all of the verbs in the second half are in the imperative mood, telling you what you ought to do now in consequence. It is gospel grammar, as Sinclair Ferguson calls it. Paul wants us to live out the new life that we have in Christ. Or, or maybe better, we could say Paul wants us to live out of the new life that we have in Christ. It's shaping our lives and relationships and marking our ambitions and our attitudes and our actions. So, on the one hand, we have to understand that Jesus isn't just bringing the theoretical blessings. And He's not just bringing pie in the sky when you die, a gospel of of good things that will only come to you later. No, Jesus is, is bringing to you now a fullness of new life that bears upon you now, a fullness of new life that you can enjoy here and now. But on the other hand, we still live in this fallen world. And while in Christ, as Paul is out in Romans 6, we have been set free from the slavery of our sin we still, Romans 7, do the very thing we wish we did not do, and do the thing that we wish we did not. To come to Christ and be, to put our faith in Him is, is not to be transported out of this world. Our lives, after we put our faith in Christ, are still lives that bear the hardships of sin, our sin and the sins of others, and sometimes, often, maybe always, uh, in fact, more so. Your coming to Jesus will, at times, and Jesus seems to indicate here, often, if not always, make those hardships more sore. Think about what Jesus says in John 15, verse 8. He says, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Hatred that comes because of our discipleship. 
Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. It, it's sobering, isn't it? But it's the reality. To come to Jesus, to put our allegiance with him, is to bear his reproach. It's to make his enemies our enemies. Remember the great illustration of salvation that John Piper paints in his book, God is the Gospel. I've used it many times before, and I will undoubtedly use it many times again because it is, it's wonderful. You remember John Piper paints this picture, and he, he paints the preacher of the Gospel like, a, like an old-fashioned town crier. And this town crier is going out, out from, we could say, the, out from Jerusalem, out from the New Jerusalem. And, and he goes out and, and he proclaims, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All rebels, insurgents, dissidents, and protesters against the king, hear the royal decree. A great day of reckoning is coming, a day of justice and vengeance. But now hear this, all inhabitants of the king's realm, amnesty is here with published by the mercy of your sovereign. A price has been paid. All debts may be forgiven. All rebellion absolved. All dishonor pardoned. None is excluded from this offer. Lay down the weapons of rebellion. Kneel in submission. Receive the royal amnesty as a gift of imperial love. Swear fealty to your sovereign and rise a free and a happy subject of your king. It's the wonderful promise of the gospel that, that you who have been in your sin a rebel and insurgent against King Jesus, you are welcome to come into Jerusalem with the promise of full and free pardon if you just lay down your weapons of rebellion and swear fealty to your sovereign. But, but let's, let's press the metaphor a little further. There you are, camped out in your little guerrilla encampment. You can imagine this walled city and hills with forests on it, and there you are, camped in your forest with your fellow rebels, and, and you hear the voice of this crier carrying across the wind, and you hear this gospel, and so you do. You, you lay down the weapons of your rebellion, and you come out from those woods, and you walk across the meadow and into the new Jerusalem. You receive the blessings that have been promised, and you've been reconciled to God, all of your sin forgiven, but, but now your former fellow insurgents are now as much your enemies as they are Christ's. You who had once stood with them, is now, you are now opposed to them, and they hate you as much as they hate the king that you have sworn loyalty to. That's the reality in which we live, peace with God, but enmity with evil. And that enmity has real consequences and comes with a real cost. Sometimes when we read the Beatitudes here in Luke, there is a temptation for us to spiritualize them, to perhaps inadvertently read them through the lens of the other, other Gospels. The, the Beatitudes that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount are slightly different from the, these on the Sermon on the Plain, and we have to distinguish them. When, when Matthew records the Beatitudes as Jesus gives them on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he records Jesus as saying there, "'Blessed are those who are poor in spirit.'" indicating a, a, a humility of heart. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who, who are seeking after God, panting after God as the deer pants for the brook, as the psalmist would say. He says, blessed are those who mourn, with the implication that the mourning there is like Jesus mourning over Jerusalem, mourning over swin, sins twisting and corrupting and blinding effect. It's easy for us to import that here, but that's not what Jesus is saying here to, to this group of disciples. If we, if we read it backwards, we get the sense, don't we? Allegiance with Christ brings, verse 22, hatred and exclusion and revilement and rejection. 
And that can manifest itself as poverty and hunger and weeping, like real hunger from a lack of food. Real poverty from a, a, a lack of money. Real weeping that comes with real heartbreak and sorrow as the cost be, comes to bear on you. And of course, this is everywhere in the New Testament, isn't it? Think of Paul's testimony of what his life as a disciple has been. Second Corinthians 11, he says, this is what being a disciple of Jesus has meant for me. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. That, that's, that's not symbolic weeping. That's real pain and weeping. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." Think about the experience of the Hebrews who were imprisoned and faced the confiscation of their property, Hebrews 10 tells us, because of their commitment to Jesus. Think about the early church martyrs in Rome whose embrace of the gospel led them to be sewn up in animal skins and thrown to lions, or who were hung on posts and burned alive to illuminate Nero's garden. Or even now, think about the church that is persecuted around the world, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, that we prayed for. Open Doors tells us that the church in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan face government surveillance of all of their meetings. Coming into churches and not knowing if one of your brothers and sisters, ostensible brothers and sisters, is actually a government agent there to report on what you're doing. Their church meetings are raided on a somewhat regular basis by the authorities. They are arrested. They, they face beatings and violence because of their commitment to Christ. They are imprisoned because of their commitment to Christ. Or think of our own experience, probably more mundane but no less real. At times, our commitment to Christ comes with a real cost upon us. Becoming a Christian can mean having to give up wealth. Perhaps it's because you know that your heart is tied too closely to the idol of mammon. And so coming to Christ means giving it away because you must turn away from the things that compete for your affections. Or maybe it's because your income, like Levi the tax collector, has come through unethical means. And, and I'm not just talking about illegal things, right? The, the drug dealer who comes to Christ obviously has to give up his drug dealing and therefore give up his source of income. But the pornographer who comes to Christ, while his business may be perfectly legal in the eyes of the government, has to give up his means of income. Or think of a more white-collar situation. I have a friend. He was president of a, of a large company, in fact, a multinational company. When he became president was convicted that, that his Christian ethics meant that he needed to lead reform in that company and lead them away from some of the unethical business practices that they were involved in. And for his trouble, he was fired by the board. And they are currently in legal wranglings because they want to give him not a cent of severance. It comes with real costs. Our allegiance to Christ might not bring the surveillance and violence and ostracism and prison that like it does in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, though it might soon, who knows? But it can cause us to lose friends. It can cause us to be alienated from family members. It can lead us to be spoken of in barbed terms with suspicions. So think of the situation in Scotland right now. Maybe you have seen this on the news, but there's a leadership contest in Scotland for the first minister position, and one of the contenders is Kate Forbes, a fine conservative Christian woman, and her name has been drug through the mud in the press. She, her character has been assassinated and torn apart uh, by journalists and by her political opponents, all because she is a Christian. 
It can bring us in to know the real pain and weeping that comes with that kind of rejection. It can be hard to be a Christian. And until the day comes when Christ returns and makes all things new and brings our salvation to its full completion and puts away evil wholly forevermore, it is the world that we will continue to live in. And if we don't realize that, we can get tripped up so easily. If we get caught up in a theology of glory and expect Christ to bring us out of temptations and trials, out of sorrows and hardships into a life of ease and plenty, we will be bitterly disappointed and we will think that Christ has failed us. We're reading through Exodus just now, aren't we? And that's what trips Israel up so often as they travel from Egypt to Canaan. It's not a world that they expected, a world in which all troubles were immediately borne away. They still face hunger and thirst and enemies and temptations, and they grumble against God and doubt His goodness. It's a running theme in the Gospels. At the feeding of the 5,000, what do the crowds want to do? John 16, John 6, 15, the crowds join the dots. They know what the feeding of the 5,000 means, and they proclaim, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And John tells us that they wanted to take him by force and make him king. It was an over-realized eschatology. They wanted glory. They wanted Jesus to go now to Jerusalem, kick out the Romans now, Jesus, and bring us into ease and victory. It's what lay behind James and John asking Jesus to be seated at the places of honor in His kingdom, thinking that their entry into Jerusalem was the time for glory, their time for ease. But then it's what lay behind the fear of the disciples in that locked upper room. Not glory, but suffering, and they didn't know what to do with it. They were leading misled lives because they misunderstood who Jesus was and what He was come to do. It's what lay behind the despondency of the disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' crucifixion and burial. It's what can lead to our despondency too. We hear these wonderful things about this new world that Jesus brings us into. We hear this great proclamation that the year of the Lord's favor that Isaiah had foreseen is now fulfilled in Christ. We read of these scenes of release and healing, but then we look at our lives and we're struggling, and it all seems so very far away from what Jesus is preaching. And if we've been expecting Jesus to bring us out onto a transcendent plane with our salvation or into a life of health and wealth and prosperity, it can feel like we have been sold a bill of goods. If, like the Israelites, we expected as soon as we crossed the Red Sea that there would be blessings without number and freedom from hardship, it can seem that it would have been better for us to just stay in our former lives. It's the tragic story that lies behind so many of those who are, quote-unquote, deconstructing. You listen to their stories and so many of them were sold this vision of life in the church, life with Christ that was only ever triumphant and abundant. And then it hit up against sin. It hit up against their own sin. It hit up against the sins of others. And suddenly the gospel rang hollow. They were expecting glory and victory, but found opposition and sorrow and hardship. And to them, it has seemed like God is a liar. But what is it that anchors our hearts in the midst of all of this? It is knowing that greater context in which we live. It's knowing that, that greater reality in which we live, our sins forgiven now, us reconciled to God now, the blessings of heaven lavished upon us now, but not only that, the hope of the day when Christ returns and our salvation is brought out into its completion. The hope of that day when Christ will return and all sin is put away and we will know God as we are known and, and we, we will realize those blessings as we dwell in the heaven, new heavens and the new earth. It's what Jesus says here, isn't it? The word blessed is a word that means joy or happiness that is rooted in the favor of God. He's saying a present enjoyment that, that transcends present circumstances, which is rooted in the knowledge that one day we will enjoy the fullness of the salvation that we enjoy in part now. Right? Look at these Beatitudes. There's a rationale attached with every one of them, isn't there? Each one of them has a for, has a, has a because that ties it explicitly to that future hope. How can you endure weeping and hunger and poverty with joy and happiness? It seems, it seems bananas. How can you do it? Only if that joy and happiness is rooted in and flows out of something far greater than anything that could be possibly taken away from you. 
Only if your heart is looking forward to that day when you will receive the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Only if your minds are captivated by that day when you will be wholly satisfied. Only if you are gripped by the thought of that day when we shall laugh with unrestrained and untainted joy in the presence of God. A day is coming when Jesus will come again. And on that day, you will come out into the fullness of your salvation. And all of your sin will be put away. And all of the consequences of your sin will be put away. John tells us in Revelation 21 that on that day, there will be no more, there'll be no more weeping. Now think about that. Think about that. Think about that. There, there's a day coming in history where the last tear will fall. Isn't that amazing? There's a day coming in history when the last heart will be broken. There's a day coming in history where, when the last hateful word will cross somebody's lips. And from that point on, the words will only be words of life and light and joy and and happiness. A day is coming when all of these things will be put away. There'll be no more hunger. There'll be no more poverty. There'll be no more weeping. Just, just joy and happiness unmitigated, delight in God, the worship of God, no distractions, nothing to compete for the affection of your heart. Christian, that is the hope of the gospel, and it holds your heart fast in the storms of this present life. Let's pray.